Okay, so where are we going to start, David? Uh, well, let's start with you introducing the topic and kind of the, dis the reason why we're having this interesting video time. Okay, so me and David are going to be going over, or we're going to be going over and then taking a deeper look of Daniel 2. And then, I mean, the reason we're doing this is I've like, I guess I made a video and there's a lot more to it than what was in that video. And I just want to, I, I David's kind of going to help me look at some verses and hopefully, since he's going to give me verses, someone else watching will get the same benefit. I won't have to redo it or anything, you know, they'll get the same verses. They'll be able to go home and study it for themselves. And so it's great. It's out there. It'll be on the internet and it'll hopefully be a great Bible study. So. Amen. Well, just to start off talking about Daniel too, a lot of people just will glibly when you go to a revelation, Daniel revelation seminar and yeah. the presenter will go through Every single presentation has the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. First one, right? First night. It's almost pretty much the first night, and it's always world history and prophecy. You know, uh, history supports prophecy, and and that's it. So it's this very kind of stale view. But when they get to the stone, yeah, uh, they, they they present it with, with just and that's Jesus coming when everything's going to be made right. And everyone goes, Amen. And then they move on, like, oh, and you got to hit the brakes do a U-turn and you just passed up like some massive insights because Daniel two all of a sudden has a lot of words in it. When it comes to the stone, there's a lot more process involved. It talks about yeah. the stone hitting it on its feet. The entire image is destroyed together. Um, these things are brought to powder. Those are all cueing language for the, for the Hebrew Bible student back in the time of Daniel. To ground something to powder actually meant something. The, the concept of a stone cut out without hands, they all knew what that meant. Yeah. But uh, does the evangelist stand there up on the stage and say, you all know what cut out without hands means? <laughs> no, nobody does. Nobody. Or, or what it means to be ground to powder or what it means that they were all gathered together in one place and that they were crushed together yeah. at this time. Which is, wait, how do you take the entire history? So obviously that's talking about Revelation chapter 20, in which all that have ever lived are all going to be simultaneously present together, the saved and the lost, in the grand Har Medigo, the grand Armageddon. And the language that's there is very fascinating. But the one thing that really put the bell ring cue in my mind is there's a there's – a, Little appreciated statement, but a very overly quoted statement from Ellen G. White that a lot of people don't give the great weight to. They just kind of glibly pass over it because it has an amen value to it, but not really a pause and think and relook at things value. And that is this. That's when she answers the question where the big uh, hullabaloo in the Minneapolis conference was Jones and Wagner coming up and – during their sermons, they were just going through Romans 3, 4, and 5 and just reading mm -hmm. it. And uh, there was some elaborating, but for the most part, they were just presenting justification by faith. And Adventists were very concerned about that because, wait a minute, we all know what justification by faith is. It's Jesus Christ forgiving your sins. Why are they putting this such an emphasis that it sounds like in our ears – they are minimizing sanctification. So they went up to Ellen White, says a lot of people writing her letters and everything else. Uh, does the doctrine of justification by faith, does it have anything to do with the three angels message really? Because the three angels message in their mind was fundamentally just about sanctification. Right. And so what is she, what was her response? The famous response was the three angels uh, message is justification by faith and verity. Right? She uses the word in ver verity. In verity, then everyone goes, in verity. And then they slide right by with some glib kind of ice skates on Greece. Like, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. And something How to know, I just want to put this in. Yeah. Ellen White used specific words. Like, she was very good at using language in the right place. Like, you know, the more you read her, like, she's actually, like, she's got a bigger vocabulary than I do. Then most people i know and she uses the words correctly and they're they're each there for a reason 
You know, like you, you actually said this to me. You said you need to read her slow, not quickly. Slow, yeah. you know. You, you need to look at her writings like you would look at anybody that had the genuine prophetic gift. And uh, if the prophetic gift is there, there won't be word slop. She won't be using word salads. If she doesn't know how to present something, she'll probably start off saying, I don't really know how to present this. And then she'll go on to presenting it in such theological eloquence that you just want to sit there and just go, oh, oh, bravo, you know? Yeah. So it's very important that, that you stop and understand. So that made me hit the brakes when I read that statement and did something that a lot of people that love to quote that statement don't mm -hmm. do. And that is, okay, I know what the three angels' message are. That's Revelation chapter 14. How can I look at each one of those three angels with the eyeballs of justification? First, I'll get, well, sanctification, we can go, for some reason, we can always talk about sanctification. If you get a group of Christians, especially some of the Adventists together, or any group of Christians together, they can talk about sanctification all day long. They it's almost you, easier to. Oh, it is, because, because guess what? You, you always find a flaw, so you can always find, you know. You can always find a flaw, and guess what? Your head is genu generally on yourself all the time. You're always yeah. thinking about you. So you always have a lot of the internal dialogue and the self-loathing, the self-hatred, and the, the self-analysis, and the advice for other people. That's all we ever think about. We're just a bunch of lizards fighting other lizards up on a flat plane somewhere in the hot sun. That's pretty much how we live. <laughs> these days it's a big lizard war but um but but what's different is that uh, what i challenge people with because in my youth sabbath school class which yeah. turned into more than a youth group it turned into a young adult to new converts to uh, people that fell away or coming back to all kinds of, it had a huge mix and so i used to challenge the group i said okay everything i read from the spirit of prophecy says that we are going to be studying the science of redemption in justification throughout all of eternity. And that new brilliant light is gonna be shined upon Calvary's cross uh, that's gonna bring awe and, and worship and, and the, the beauty of it before our eyes in the ceaseless ages of time. I'm going, wow, is it really that deep? Is justification worthy of the, the highest science? Of all those sciences, you're gonna have this amazing set of capacities this amazing ability to, to, to not look through a glass darkly. We're going to look into the astronomical science. She says that we're going to have microscopic and telescopic vision. I've read that. That is amazing that you can look at atoms with your eyeballs. I mean, that's stuff that you cannot do on drugs. I don't, wouldn't even want to do it on LSD. But to <laughs> actually be in that yeah. new body, to have that capacity to study with your own mind, with your yeah. own... Uh, 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 instrument. Yeah. That's powerful. With all of that in mind, she says, bar none, the highest science that will expand the mind and bring new beauty yeah. to your mind and press you on is the study of Calvary's cross. I'm going, but wait a minute. That seems so simple, dimple to me. And it's like, is everyone going to be a bunch of idiots up there? No, there's going to be the most brilliant minds ever blown away. So yeah. I'm thinking, okay, then we have a problem. I seem to not understand the profoundness of an infinite imputed righteousness in the work of Christ. What happened? What am I not seeing about the work of Christ that is going to spend any, I'm going to need to spend an eternity unpacking this thing. Yeah. Because I can tell you this much, and then I'm reading with that in mind, I'm reading in early writings where, you know, I'm reading on the 144,000. Yep. And so Ellen White is, uh, you know, it's after the resurrection and everyone, she has a vision. Everyone is under the tree of life and they're by the river of life. And these two elders were asking the question saying, what did you guys go through? What was the suffering? What was the trials you guys went through? And before they can even get started in the conversation, they said, nah. It's cheap enough. Forget it. That's not sanctification was the most boring subject in all the universe in heaven. Mm -hmm. They wanted to jump immediately to let's get started on this incredible thing that makes us worship. Now, I'm saying all this not in vain. I'm saying this to really set up a mindset here. Yeah. And that is the the to look at the three angels message 
with the pair of eyes that says this primarily is going to be about justification and secondarily about sanctification. So I asked uh, my students, why is that we can always, when we go on our hikes, we spend all day in fellowship together. Uh, it's Everyone can talk a lot about sanctification. Can we spend one day, more than just a few minutes, forcing our minds and asking God to help us to only talk about justification, imputed righteousness, substitutionary righteousness all day on the Sabbath? Mm. Can we ask God to stretch our minds to do that? If, if, what, if all we talk about here is sanctification and it dried up Adventism as the hills of Gilboa, yeah. if the talk of justification, what she called the beginning of the outpouring of the latter rain, why is it we seem to have this bizarre challenge to not spend more than five minutes talking about imputed righteousness. So I challenged my class to do that, and because I did that, breakthroughs were happening. F refreshment in Bible study, adoration and love of Christ, the power of sin being broken in people's lives, uh, uh, genuinely saying, I wanna give my life fully to Christ. I've been going to church my whole life, and I've never seen this before. And, That's the result of doing that. And the best part is, is that you get a Sabbath every week, so there's a guaranteed time to do that, you know? To me, that's that's the Sabbath. The Sabbath, it's just that God refreshed himself on the Sabbath. That's an interesting verse in the Old Testament, because obviously God wasn't tired. He wasn't like, whoo, that was a lot of work, you know? No. And uh, obviously, being omnipotent, that wasn't a lot of work. The word refresh is to go back, and he found great joy in looking at, are you ready for this? His works. His works are good, and his works please him, and he gets great delight in his works, and he wants us to delight ourselves in his works, okay? So not just in creation, but what about his works in redemption and salvation? Why aren't we entering into his, what does Isaiah 58 say? It says if you enter in, if you turn your foot away from your pleasure, and yeah. do what? Serve do that which, or... Yes. Do that what pleases me. Yeah. God refreshed himself on the Sabbath, and what did he do? He would go and survey all that he did, and he says, man, this is good. This is good. And then since I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and I made the Sabbath for man, come on, sit with me. Let's look at what I did and why I did what I did, and, and I want you to enter into my rest, into my refreshment, into my restoration, into my joy. All of that's all tied up into that idea. So why not spend the entire Sabbath focused upon his works of redemption. And you know what? I found out that that was a great measuring rod as to where we are in understanding um, righteousness by faith. If, if we could only, if we're bored to tears in three minutes, then I think we got to, uh, a serious milk to meat ratio problems. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I started studying it, I could spend all day talking. People get kind of annoyed with me because I would just, I'd go on and keep talking. My mom even said, she's like, every time we start talking, you always talk about justification by faith. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it's just on my mind. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's well, like, there, repeat, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, every day, it's like a daily thing. It's like, oh, that's something I'm thinking about at one point in my day, you know? You know, and that should be our true new exercise because she even says that this is what breaks the power of Satan. Not the focus on sanctification, but the irony is, is on the uplifting of Christ and his imputed righteousness breaks the power of Satan. That's why Satan does not want us to uplift that. He doesn't want his power broken. And yeah. that is so important. And this study shouldn't be any different. Can I just throw out this little bone here? Yeah, go ahead. So really, if you want to boil down what is Seventh-day Adventism, it's certainly not uh, the rostrum of church worship service. It's certainly not... Worthington and Loma Linda canned vegetarian food products. It's certainly not all this other trappings. What is the thing that really distinguishes? Because even keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, there are Seventh-day Baptists, there are Seventh-day Pentecostals even. There is the Hebraic Roots Movement. Yeah. So it's not that unique. There's the World's Last Chance. There's Worldwide Church of God. There's lots of groups that keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, okay? So that is a distinguishing feature, but it's not utterly unique. The state of the dead. 
even Martin Luther had a period where he understood the state of the dead and that the wicked could not live forever in torment that he even himself said, Martin Luther said yeah. that the doctrine of the immortal soul came from, you know, p paganism and, and, you know, the infiltration of paganism in Christianity but yeah. through the church fathers. So at some point, uh, there are groups that, uh, like, who's that guy, Fudge, Edward Fudge, you know, there's this, this whole little movie that he was just a Christian and he was just studying the issue. And he starts preaching it, and he gets in all this trouble in his town. He's debating all these preachers in his town because he's teaching the state of the dead. Yeah. And it caused all this stir. So that's not even what makes Adventists unique. What is the one doctrine that if you were to say this is the purpose for Adventism, what's the one doctrine? The sanctuary? October 22, 1844, Christ oh, living in the most holy place. The Day of Atonement. David yes, David. in the context of understanding sanctuary typology right. no doubt about it so if that is the grand jewel the crown jewel the one thing god was going to restore to prepare the 144,000 yeah and, and why is it that that's the one thing that has been minimized attacked uh, uh it's taken it's had bites taken out of that thing endlessly all throughout its history there must be something really important about that reality mm -hmm. so with that in mind, if you were to look at, for example, Dan, for example, Daniel 8.14, here's a clue. One clue is, is that it's the word for cleanse, is the word for righteousness, the word used for imputed righteousness. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, please do. Uh, and he said to me, so this is Daniel 8.14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay, so if you can, do you have the blue letter uh, that you can throw up on the screen? Yeah, here, just start talking a little bit about that. I'm going to throw sure. it up for a second. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is this cleansing of the sanctuary. There's been a bunch of debate because they're saying, well, it's not a real strict kind of parallel because, yes, the sanctuary was cleansed, but word is a different word that's been used in Leviticus 16. Well, there's a reason why that word is used because... Daniel was talking about the broad concept of justification. It is now. Now here, here's the key to really studying prophecy. If you could get just the prophecy seminars out of your mind of how we interpret things uh, uh, through that the method that we do. If you were to just strictly go with a biblical way of how the Jews or how the prophets or how Moses would interpret things, this is how they did it. They use the plan of salvation as a, excuse me, they use the agricultural year as a type of the plan of salvation. It would start in Abib and would end in Tishri. But you had those winter months, so it's not like they threw them out. But that right. was, so you had what's called the early spring feasts that started the year, and then you had the later fall feasts that ended the year. And believe it or not, that cycle of the feasts and everything else was ty typological. That's why we don't keep the feasts now. Of what? The plan of salvation of Christ's high priestly ministry. Christ dies upon Calvary's cross. What was fulfilled? Passover. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, right. And then, then he's laying in the tomb uh, as unleavened bread. There's no corruption, right? So that's the... Uh, the, the the feast of uh, the unleavened bread. Okay, and then so. you have, you know, the day of Pentecost, which Christ ascends up to heaven, and he is anointed as the high priest, and that's the idea of the oil being splashed down over the head of Aaron, the high priest, and has fallen on the body of the high priest, which is the disciples on the day of Pentecost. So those were the spring feasts, and then so you have the early history of the um, early feasts being played out. And then you have this long, dry period under the sun that prophetically is being uh, spoken about as the 1260 years. So that's right, so, a dry, dry summer period. So just to go back really, really quick, Daniel 8.14, so we're looking at... To be cleansed, right? And you said right. Sadak. Sadak. And so Zadak is what? To be cleansed, but mostly it's about what? Justification. To you be notice just. Justified. 
Yeah, where is it? Justify. Oh, to to be appear vindicate. righteous. To make yeah. someone righteous. It's the word for justification. You can't get out of it. The emphasis of October 22, 1844 is justification. Like it or not, folks, it is. We got more to talk about this, but I just want to kind of establish these points as we go along. Okay. Okay? So we can't ignore that. Also, let's go ahead and go to um, – that's the root word for what uh, happens in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So go ahead and type that in, Genesis uh, 15, 6. And those, that's a very famous verse, right? Go ahead and hit the blue letter, uh, uh, the strongs on that one. Okay, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Obviously, Paul brings this up right in Romans, talking right. about Abraham. Right, and the word righteousness is what? At the bottom there. Right here. It's see, yeah. you got the same it, ending. It's, a, it's the same word. All it yeah. is is you have one in the noun form and one in the verb form. That's all it is. You see, go okay. ahead and go to the root. Go ahead and go to the root uh, and click uh, root, that. Click it? Yeah. yeah. And what is it? It's the word that we just got done looking at. Yeah. So, so it's fundamental. It's the same word, guys. It's just it's just talking about one, one is in a feminine noun, the other is just in a. But it's not anything hung up on. What is it fundamentally talking about? It's talking about imputation of righteousness, a righteousness that could only be obtained to through faith in somebody else's applied righteousness. That is the emphasis of October 22, 1844. Okay. So, so let's now stick that in our brains, and then let's move on to. This process of the feast. This is what's important about studying typology in the sanctuary. Is um, go back to Daniel chapter eight. Real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. I stopped sharing right there. Here, I got you. No, nah, you're gonna have to probably keep some of this up for a little while. We're gonna be hitting some verses okay. because I don't want it to just be my opinion. I want people to actually see it. Okay, I got you. So let's go to uh, uh, Daniel chapter eight. And go ahead and slide on down, you know, go to like verse 16. Uh, I don't know if it's 16, let me see. So right there you have, Daniel was wondering, he just read eight, uh, Daniel 4, 8, 14, right? Yeah. So he's, so what shall be cleansed. Then it happened right. when I, Daniel, had seen the vision or seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. Keep reading until you get down a little ways. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uliah who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he called near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of a man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now stop real quick. Is right. that, I want you to pay, no, don't don't click out of that, whatever you do. I'm Is uh... <laughs> I got you, I got you, I'm staying. All right, All right. because we're going to move through this a little bit. Okay. is that the emphasis is Daniel didn't understand it. Remember, the prophets had a harder time understanding what was being told to them, but we are in the end of times, and God says, I will give you understanding. He says in Daniel 12, I'll give the wise understanding. Christ says, him who read of Daniel, let him understand. God wants to give us wisdom and understanding right now to make applications. So this is what we're going to do, is that it's the time of the end, right? Yeah. So keep reading down, because I want you to read all the way down to verse 19. Now, as he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the point in time the end shall be. Okay, now go ahead and go to your strongs right there in verse 19. The emphasis is going to be at the time of the end. The appointed time, Moed, gets. is the appointed time. Moed. Go to Moed first. No, don't click on it. It's okay. okay. And then look at Gets. It's Moed Gets. Moed Gets, yep. Moed, the Moed were the feasts. The Moed were called the gatherings, the feast, the Moed. And, and the feasts were called the Moed Deem. Deem is a suffix. It's, it's plurality. It's the idea of these are the feasts, the Moed Deem. Mm-hmm. And the Moyad gets was always in reference to the fall feasts. Okay. The Moyadim were, were fundamentally always talking about the spring feasts, which is Passover, unleavened bread, uh, Pentecost, right? Yeah. The Moyad gets 
was always an eschatological picture. It was always in reference to the trumpets, to the Day of Atonement, and the tabernacles. So he's saying that this will be, this is in reference to the Moyad Gets. This is going to be talking about year day principle coming out of Leviticus 25. That's where we get all this year day principle from. It's not from numbers and it's not primarily from Ezekiel as, as the uh, prophecy seminar guys like to originally quote. They keep missing what they're building this idea from. It's when God spoke about this idea of the him liberating captives and how he's going to restore and return land. The idea of the eschatological end, in other words, when God justifies or he rectifies everything or he fixes everything at the end of time, yeah. that is called a moyed gets. He's going he's gonna to bring, bring everything back to its rightful place. And that's where you get the idea of Zadik or Tazadik. Okay. It's, it's when he restores everything. He brings everything to what he intends it to be. And he's going to do that through a, a priesthood, that a priesthood that culminates in a, a trumpets, a day of atonement, and a tabernacles, and then he's going to restore everything in a high priestly ministry that is a called the day, the yoma. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead. Now, now, what's interesting is the entire gospel and the Reformation is yeah, fundamentally. Yeah, is, is fundamentally built upon the um, passage that came from Habakkuk that everyone thinks it was Paul that said at first, that the just shall live by faith, right? Right, yeah, the just shall, well, he took that, right. That was he a took, condensed statement by Habakkuk, right? Right, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, so, sorry. Well, it doesn't matter, but it's, you probably even said it, I think, more accurately. But the truth is, is that Paul or any of the Hebrew writers were always referring to things that if you were familiar with that person's writings, like Habakkuk, that you would be, um, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, th that whole idea of, of uh, the just shall live by faith. And then they have the whole concept of what was going on in Habakkuk in their mind. But we don't. We're these kind of these New Testament Gentiles, and we just kind of, oh, okay, he said this, and then we start to talk and speculate and share yeah. our ideas in, in classes. That's all we do. But the key, the habit needs to be, is to go back and to see what in the world Habakkuk was talking about. I think we take for granted, too, some of the words Paul uses, because when we read it, we, we feel that we've been told it so many times over, that that's that you what it must be. Yeah. But I think as a Bible student, you can't, tr you, it sounds kind of cynical, but you can't t trust anybody f for face value. Not even your friend. Like it's not even worth trusting someone else you, to trust. You know God at His word alone. So doing this is very important. Um, if you were on trial for yeah. a capital uh, for a capital case in which your life is hanging in the balances, and are you going to leave everything up to your lawyer that may not be competent? You know, like, like I would be in the law library of that prison every single day fighting for my life and that's how we should be looking at the scriptures you know i mean in some sense right okay but let's get back on the subject because we, we cannot get straight right this is we have to make a very quick connect okay. and not 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 lose this connect right now go to habakkuk <laughs> before we go what we're we talking about again because we can't do that right now what chapter two where is that phrase of justification by faith go ahead and start with one maybe Read four on. Just start verse one. Oh, you want me to read it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Context. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. Rampart? Yeah. Rampart. And watch and see what he will say to me. And what I will answer, I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Then he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. And it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith, by his Stop. faith. Yeah, Stop okay. there. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. And I, I wish I had the attention of 
many people, and we would do an entire 10 day series just on those verses. But since for time's sake, we don't, <laughs> let's just go to, uh, go to the strongs of verse three. See if you can find your Moyed Gets again. Where are you? Moyed Gets right here. Why is Moyed Gets there? What's this Moyed Gets? Hmm. What is this time of the end? What is this justification by faith that happens in the fall feasts? The Day of Atonement is absent. And then if you were to, we don't have to go to it right now, we can just discuss it. Why is Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23 that talks about the Day of Atonement, which they refer to as the day, when you, when you hear that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together so much more as we see the day approaching, they all knew what that meant. That means the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. Now, what's fascinating is that the mistake that all the Advent people made was that when Christ uh, enters into the Day of Atonement, that always means what? Jesus is coming in the clouds. Right. They Wasn't that, that the problem? That was but the... Uriah Smith perpetuated that problem by not understanding that the Moya gets or the stone cut out without hands or the day or the everlasting gospel isn't when Christ shows up in the clouds of glory, but it's when he moves as a high priest into the function of atonement that that is the stone cut out without hands. The process has now begun, and this is what we are to be, we're going to be talking about a lot more, but this is the, the stone that destroys the image is the proclamation of this everlasting gospel. Believe it or not, this is how God's going to take down the kingdoms of this world, is through this the, bringing everyone under the law. The law brings forth the wrath of God. You are to bring forth the law so they may seek a high priest to stand righteous on this day of atonement. Christ is in the days of his espousal right now. Hmm. We're not looking forward to a day of atonement. We're in the day of atonement. There should be a special proclamation of justification by faith. The just shall live by faith of this great stone proclamation. All throughout the New Testament, yeah, even like Christ it. himself, the stone was always a picture of what? the work of Christ, and the proclamation of the gospel. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's in Matthew 21. It's in all of their writings where they're talking about the stone of stumbling, right. the stone that was rejected by the builders. They're accessing clear gospel insights into things like Isaiah chapter 8 and Psalms 118. And the stone that was cut out without hands is always a very familiar idea of the stone of which God is founding his kingdom or his government. Remember, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Daniel chapter 2 is obsessed with the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not primarily and only talking about the coming of Christ. It's, it's founded upon the righteousness that he brought to man's sin, to man's um, violation of the law, to man's uh, ripping the fabric of God's government. I mean, we're talking about his high priestly work. And remember, I mean, just for discussion's sake, Zach. Yeah. What was uh, what was the big question to uh, his disciples? Uh, who do people say that I am? Oh, P right. Who do I say? And then didn't Peter say to back to Jesus? People say that you're uh, Elijah, you're uh, you're a prophet, you're you're Jeremiah, you're oh, you know, oh, yeah, you're Jeremiah, yeah. But what was what was the dealio? What what did they finally realize? That they what didn't did believe say? that. Peter said, "You're the Son of God." Yeah, no, you're the Messiah. Yeah. You're, you're the son of God. You're the Mashiach. And Christ said to him, upon what? Upon this stone. Upon this stone. Upon this stone. So he changes his name to Peter, which was Little Rock, right? And uh, so it wasn't upon Peter. The Catholics have always turned it into an ontological reality. No, Peter. It's going to be built on Peter. 
But no, he says, I'm going to build, I'm going to tear down the kingdoms. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. Believe me, that's not accidental language when he says not one stone will be left upon another. Because there's going to be a stone that comes that is going to turn all the kingdoms of this world into powder. Anytime that Christ references that stone, he's not talking about his coming in the clouds of glory. He's talking about establishing his righteousness as a gift to his people. That will destroy all of the claims and all the territorial claims and all the deed claims of Satan. He will reclaim what is his own because he had redeemed it. He bought it back. He brought his righteousness to it. And this doesn't seem very as solid in the minds of Christians as it should be. It seems like more of a fluffy idea, more of a mystical idea, but not for the foundational uh, epic um, anchor that hits the bottom and says, this is your anchor, buddy. This is what you're going to build upon. My, my kingdom is built upon my righteousness being applied to you. And Ad Adventists should be going crazy because this is the Day of Atonement, and this is that, that portion of the Day of Atonement in which you still have time to get your sacrifices in. This is the gospel portion. There is a portion of the Day of Atonement where it is the sealed and the mark. There's, there's a point where it's cut off. Yeah. There's a point. We're at the most opportune point of the Day of Atonement, and we are sitting around looking at our belly buttons. Isn't that funny? That's my whole thing. Like, I probably say that in almost every video that I've made thus far, and I haven't made that many videos yet, but making your home, like, oh, in my video, video of this topic, I said, you know, you either make your home here or, you know, you have to act as though your home is in the kingdom to come. Right. That you, we are, we, yeah, like you are adopted through the hearing of this word. That's the stone that you do what? What's Matthew 21 tell you? That you fall upon the stone or even Luke chapter 20. Just yeah. stay with 20 right there. And you should be what? Broken. Go ahead and read that. So Luke chapter 20, verse 18. Whoever falls on that no, stone no, so will start be with broken. Verse, I'm sorry. Start with verse 17, please. Oh, here. I'll just click on it and read it. Then he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. It's sounding a lot like the Daniel 2 stuff, isn't it? Yeah, that's the mirror. That's like where I went to, you know? Yeah. That's exactly what it made me think of. Now, 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 what, now, what's the reference there to that verse? Go ahead and, there you go, Psalms 118. Go ahead and go to Psalms 118, why not? Okay. That's the reference that Jesus was using. So how do you look at 118? Right? Uh-oh, did I click, did I go? Yeah, yeah, no, you're fine. You're fine. You stay right there. Now, what's interesting is that... And I don't know where you can start. Let's go a little bit. See, surrounding me. Da -da. Well, stop right there. Stop right there. Wait, I'm sorry. Go, just stop right there. Uh, yeah. Verse 14 it says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He has become my salvation. Keep reading on, please. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builder, builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is it is marvelous. It is marvelous in our eyes. You want me to keep going? No, well, yeah, please do, actually. Finish out the... This is the day the Lord has made. We will This rejoice. is the day, the Yoma. This is the day, and then prior to that says, it is marvelous in our eyes. The word marvelous there is where we get the word wonderful. It's the word Pella or Pelham. His name is wonderful. When uh, at any time the angel of the Lord, which was Christ, he came and they said, what is your name? He always used that word. 
It is something that distinguishes himself from anything else. He's the chiefest among 10,000. He is Pella. He is the one that uh, nobody can compare himself to. It's a marvelous work that he has done and that he doesn't just give us salvation. He is our salvation. But keep reading. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords with the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercies endure forever. I wish I could really break down that psalm and actually go a little bit before you started reading because it gives you the context that he's he's talking about the sanctuary. Let's see. Let's start. Let's just look real quick. Uh, go ahead and scroll down a little bit more. But it says, wait, look at right there. It says, the Lord among, it says, therefore I see my desire to those who hate me. But go ahead, just keep scrolling down. Um, this is where we started, right? Or no, yeah. We... Yeah, right around there. But, but, but as you can see there, was like the, it says the idea of the house of the Lord. Or the tents. He, yeah, the tents. But the tents of the righteous is where we live. But the house of the Lord, I, I, man, do I got to do, I'm going to have to go to Psalms 118 myself. Because for some reason, my eyes aren't seeing it very well. But Psalms 118, when Jonah was in the belly of the whale, Psalms 20, over and over again, when God... What he's doing is he's, tr is tr oh. he's tr our eyes to the temple in heaven. Go is ahead. Is it the beginning? Because there's a little dialogue that the psalmist records. He says, let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercies endure forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercies endures forever. I called on the, on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surround me, yes, they surround me. But in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Yeah, if you look at verse 15, it says, The voice of the rejoicing and, and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The righteous doeth valiantly. And over and over, as you see the context here, is that this is being quoted all through the New Testament. Psalms 118 is one of those mega quotes. Yeah. And what you get here in this idea of something enduring forever, it is the mediation of God, his works of righteousness, that... Even though we're overwhelmed by the enemy, even though Satan has great accusation against us, even though he's trying to execute capital, uh, author uh, capital punishment authority over us because we were uh, escaped captives, just like the children of Israel were escaped captives of Pharaoh. That Pharaoh says, no, they're still my slaves. And God says, no, I've redeemed them. I purchased them. And you are now going after them unlawfully. Well, in Habakkuk chapter 1 and 2, God allows the Chaldeans to be as a punishing instrument over God's people. And then he says, I'm going to do a work that if I told you, you would not understand it. That is the same context that Isaiah is talking about, saying that if he were to tell you, who would believe it? It's this concept that God is going to bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. He's going to put his people under great affliction, and he's going to deliver them. But he's going to do it through his righteousness, not their righteousness, but he's going to do it by them appealing to his mediation and the covenant fulfillment that he has promised that he would fulfill it in their place. And that he would be the champion for his people through what? This is the point. This is what Adventism needs to turn this entire focus to. We will have our victory because... Christ is my salvation. He is my righteousness. It's righteousness by faith in somebody else's righteousness that can break the legal claims that Satan has upon each one of us. Therefore, great answers will be brought down from heaven. The Holy Spirit will come down because we have now put our faith, our trust in the one who was a sin bearer.
And right. it's through his righteousness, his power, his perfection. And what I mean by power, I'm not talking about his power in me. That's secondary. I'm talking about the fact that he came and brought himself to the battle zone in a human body and fought Satan under the law born of a woman. And he came under the obligatory system. And he triumphed. He triumphed. And he ascended to heaven. And he says, believe it or not, that's your battle. Your battle is with fixing the gulf between heaven and the grave. And that is the zone he has conquered. Calvary's cross was where he conquered the impassable pass. Now, this is pure gospel, what I'm talking about here. But this is the emphasis of the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is all about resting and trusting in somebody else's works, somebody else's righteousness, somebody else's mediation, someone else's atonement. And for some reason, you tend to hear the cleansing of the sanctuary fundamentally be about us as the sanctuary. Us, inside of our hearts, we need to expel sin out of our hearts as the fundamental primary emphasis. And that's all you hear. And Ellen White herself says, we've been preaching that until the very hills have grown dry as a bone. Do you see that that's not the way to get the rain? But we're like, yeah. we're like an addict. We're saying, no, 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 we need more drugs. No, 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 we need, you know, more alcohol. And, and God's saying the very definition of insanity is to insist upon doing the same destructive thing over and over again. Insist that it's going to give you a different outcome at some point. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. But real quick is that when, when Wagner... In Minneapolis, reset things and let's emphasize justification by faith. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to show up. Yeah. And she what she tried to point out the irony of that. Don't you guys see that we're we're putting the cart before the horse? But and this she, goes with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just want to set that up and okay. then go ahead. I'm, I'm sure you want to say something about this. Well, I was just gonna say that reminded me of Ezekiel. I was reading this the other day, and the word of the Lord came to me saying. Son of man, say to her, you are in a land that is not cleansed. And if you look at the little footnote, right, it says following mosaic text, Syriac text, Vulgate, reads showered upon. So you are you are in a land that is not showered upon or rained on in this day of indignation. And then you he goes on to say why. And it says, and Ezekiel says, her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between what? The right. holy and the unholy. Right. Nor have they made a, uh, known the difference between the unclean and the clean. That's why they're dry, because they well, can't hey, figure it out. And the irony is, is look how it's emphasizing the Sabbath. That oh, yeah. has always been the idea of the Sabbath was always a picture of resting in somebody else's works. And I don't know why we can't seem to get that as a fundamental concept of justification by faith. I don't know why that's lost on us. That's crazy. We can't make that connection. Yeah. We strictly see uh, Sabbath keeping as purely sanctification. It's a memorial of justification. And do you know how I could prove it to you? Is it says that the Sabbath is a sign between my people and me Right? Yep. It's a sign between me and my people. Go ahead and go to Romans chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Let's look at this concept of a sign. And receive the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he mm -hmm. had while still uncircumcised. Hint, righteousness by faith. Keep reading. That he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Now, when we referenced Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it's talking about this exact situation. It's about Abraham in the concept of that God had imputed righteousness to Abraham 14 years before he was even circumcised. Wow, yeah. Right? Yep. What does circumcision represent? Circumcision represents as a sign or a slash seal of the righteousness you received by faith. Hmm. 
Sanctification yep. is a sign or a seal of the righteousness you received by faith. It says while, he, or I guess the italics are added words, but for which... While still uncircumcised. It's, yeah. it's a true statement. Yeah, right. It, he, it trust me, he wasn't circumcised 14 years before he was circumcised. I could guarantee you that. Right. So faith which he had while still uncircumcised. So this righteousness but, of faith is... It's, but but, but it's, stop. yeah, I want yeah. you to put because because these are these slicky fast statements we go past so fast, but we gotta go slow today, Zach. Okay. Real slow. We're gonna inch our way. The seal of God, which is sanctification, which is Sabbath keeping. The seal is the Sabbath. Seal, sanctification, Sabbath. Don't separate that. That's true. It's together. We're gonna keep it there. That's not gonna go away, and it will never go away. That's solid, rock solid. Seal, Sabbath keeping, sanctification. Solid. What I'm about to say will not deconstruct this. Stay okay. with that. My fist is the, the, that, that truth together. Okay. Righteousness by faith, you cannot conflate righteousness by faith with this. His circumcision was a demonstration or a sign of something that was invisible that he obtained to you 14 years earlier. Hmm. Now, I'm not talking about that there's always a 14-year drag between justification sanctification but god separated enough for us to say there is a distinction between the two gang there really is and in abraham's case it was about 14 years mm. he separated it by time and everything else but what happens here is the reality and what happens here is the sign sanctification is a sign Sanctification, a seal and a sign aren't the substance. It's a demonstration of this reality here. Okay. So this here is justification. This is imputed righteousness. This is righteousness by faith. This is the sign or the seal or the demonstration or the testimony of something that happened here. This is the shadow, the pattern, the... You know, I mean, the, the unsubstantial demonstration, it's a testimony of it, but it's not the substance of it. It's a sign that we are, what? Righteous by faith. That whole verse is talking about righteousness by faith. It's the Magna Carta verse of righteousness by faith. And so, yet we conflate these two. But he's trying to say that this Sabbath keeping, circumcision, yeah. a changed heart, uh, as, um, sanctified life, is a sign and a seal to what? To something that happened 14 years earlier in a totally separate event. But they're related to each other, but you don't conflate the two. So he's saying this seal or this sign of the righteousness of faith. It's I'm, a just, I'm just right. reiterating, reiterating what you just said, but right, right. the seal is the tangible part of the righteousness by faith. It's tangible to you and to other people, but this is the key. This is what yes. I fail to do in all my talks, but God's got to give me the spirit to do this. That's not the substance. The right. substance is in heaven. And I, I can say it till I turn blue and pass out of a heart attack, and I don't think I'm getting my point across. We are not the substance, boys and girls. Our ontological dance is nothing. It's what is so in heaven before God in Christ that's okay. the reality, and we're the dance. We're the dust bunnies doing the dance, but we're not the substance. We're not the, the reality. Reflection. Of it. At best. At best. And guess what? Even if we do it in hypocrisy, it still looks the same. That's the sad thing. They will it, never it can be, be faked, right? Faked. All righteousness can be faked. But here's the point. So that's not the substance God builds it upon. You could do it out of hypocrisy. You could do it out of sincerity, but it's still a sign. It is, it is, it's like people's good works. You could, you could do good works for all the evil reasons of the world because people applaud you and give you award ceremonies and they esteem you. But if you do good works, that is still a sign of, of genuineness too. Right. But it's certainly God doesn't count it as the substance. It's a sign. It will definitely be there. Unmistakably speaking, it will be there. Law keeping will be there for the righteous because it's a sign, it's a fruit, it's a demonstration, but God doesn't build on signs. He, a sign is only a testimony of something of something that is more real. It's for other people. 
yeah, it's it's for other people, and why not let it be for the cosmic universe that is watching on this weird earthly stage? But it is for outward demonstration. It could be for hypocrisy. It could be for genuineness, but it's still a sign, and it's still a demonstration. But that is not the substance, and and that's the problem. We keep thinking that's the substance. Right. It's not the substance, and I could tell theologians sound blue in the face, and they're just like, huh, what are you even talking about? We've conflated everything. I am the substance, and my church is the substance, and my universe is the substance, and my books are the substance, and my friendships are the substance. We are sick. We are sick. We actually think we're the substance. Yeah. No, guess what? God is up in heaven, and guess what? He's looking at substance. It's sitting in his right hand. His name is Jesus. Yeah, right. He Hebrews. is the foundation. He is the stone. If you go to First Peter chapter 2, you're going to find out who the real substance is, the real stone. It's not Peter. Peter himself takes all emphasis away from himself and go to uh, 4 and read on down. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, a living stones, are built, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. Stop. Just stop right there. It's perfect. Don't go any further. Because that word appointed is no accident either. The idea of uh, the... It's, it's a moyadim. He's kind of focusing. He's doing a little bit of wordplay there. But obviously, if anyone thought that, that Jesus was referring to Peter as the stone, uh, Peter was, it certainly got Miss Peter. It's like, huh? No, I've, Christ is the stone. That's an emphasis of all of Peter's. Mm -hmm. Of all the illustration Peter uses, he's using stone, chief cornerstone, the, the rock the builders rejected. I mean, obviously, Peter never got the idea that Christ was going to build his church on Peter. He wasn't going to build it on ontological sand. That's all right. we are. The children of Israel were called sand, and God was called a rock. Did you know that? So when Jesus said that oh. I'm... Oh. Yeah. So like if the you sand of the that, seas? Yeah. Yeah. So guess what? So when he used that illustration that it's foolish to build uh, your house on what? Sand. Hmm. On the people. On us. But all of our sermons are about glorious us, glorious our church, glorious us as a people, glorious us as we gather together. God says, I'm not building my church on Peter or on the sand. I'm building it on the rock. Yeah, isn't that the... Isn't the much that, like, substantial what? is Christ. Right, we have is, that's the opposite like of... Like, that's the opposite. That's basically, those are the characteristics. What well, you're talking against are the characteristics of the beast in revelation exactly you guys uh, you know anyone watching this i'm so emphatic about it because my heart is broken that no matter how much you tell church ecclesiastical that we are to uplift christ that that will break the power of satan that will bring the outpouring of the latter rain that will take focus off of self you will see greater acts of obedience and having the power of satan broken upon us if you do focus on justification by faith and all the prebites and all the ML and Dreesonites and all the Wagnerites are going, nah, -uh, we got to go back and refocus on our belly buttons again, because God is really looking at righteousness in me. That's what's going to bring Jesus home. And God is like, don't do it to yourselves. What again. if, what about people Just that do put, again. what about people that do focus on that? But then they say, you know what, but it's all about Jesus. Like I hear that. Sure. Yeah. The, you mean the glib version? You mean the, the lip service? You mean the, the – uh, can I just share this with you? Yeah, go ahead. One of the greatest tactics Save never uses is glib and soft praise to justification. You cannot do a better job than smother it in mayonnaise to destroy it. And that's what people do.
They don't understand that the scripture doesn't think that way. The proclamation of justification by faith are to people that are bound in prison and someone is going by and ripping open prison doors and they're fleeing out of jail. Yeah. Oh, that's the sanctified life, by the way. <laughs> You're running, man. And even the idea of the gospel was always a picture of running. Mm -hmm. Let him who readeth run. You'll see that over and over and over again. It's the idea of you don't even know the prison house you're in. The gospel shines a light on the jail that you're in. And then he comes and he unlocks the door and sets you free. And then you go as far from that prison as you can. That's your sanctified life. People that glibly say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, this is a prison. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'm set free. Oh, that's cool. And then someone unlocks the door and they just sit there goofing off on their bed waiting for the next meal to come. And that's not the same thing. There is two ways. This is, you know, Ellen White said it way better than I'm going to say it, but she said it so well. And I don't have the quote at my little fingertips. This is what she said. Do you know where it is? No, but, but you'll see the concept. It's okay, not hard okay. to get. She says, there's a difference between people who look at justification by faith from the outside versus people who look at it from the inside. There's not a single person who's ever been set free uh, by, the, by the pall of sin and death that Satan has us under and been delivered from uh, the wrath of God and ever would think to, to minimize sin, would ever think to, to presume upon God's grace. Nobody from the inside talks that way about justification. Only outsiders talk of this idea that it's a glib thing that I believe it in. It's an intellectual idea. Of course, I don't put my whole heart, my right. soul. In. That is a split soul. That is the definition of schizophrenia. That's the idea that my heart or my, excuse me, my mind has ascended to it, but everything else is standing afar off. So no, but another way to say it would be anybody that really knows justification by faith like is going to be on a sanctified journey they're never going to use that to take uh, advantage uh, of god's mercy yeah no no they, yeah they, they take full hold of of what the impact of being set free by christ is they they absolutely get it and people that, that are standing afar off avail themselves of justification if they at all are seeing it from this kind of uh licentious um, nominal idea. She says because you're seeing it as an outside analytical, as an argument, but you're not you're not going inside the tent and seeing all the glory of it. You're not going in the temple and going, whoa, what's going on here? Oh, this, this is this is me setting you free. Whoa, wow, you live from the house of the wicked unto the tents of God. How can I serve my, my master? How can I live for you? How can, that's that's the real spirit or the sign or the demonstration of somebody that's been set free. They embrace holiness. They embrace, um, they embrace everything that, that is pleasing to God. Does that make sense? Absolutely. But, but the people that are sitting there talking from this pot shot, backseat, uh, driver, armchair, quarterback style, they've never even availed themselves of it, or they wouldn't even dare let that 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 representation of justification even escaped their lips. It wouldn't happen. Yeah, and it's, I think on she the does other a side job, too. She does a great job of nailing those people because because to intellectualize this thing, you've obviously uh, haven't uh, entered in as an insider. You just. I think also too. When you focus, even if you have the correct idea of both justification and sanctification and then in your thinking or in your sharing rather you focus on sanctification you're really sh letting this is what people are going to you have to keep in mind this is what people are going to hear so when you're sharing with an emphasis on sanctification they're thinking oh christianity is about doing works but if you switch the emphasis like it should be you know the balance is strong focus on justification and you understand sanctification I, I don't think you should ever preach with one oar in the water i think that's the most lamest way of preaching in the world that's why you that's why the whole church is going around in circles over this yeah so i mean and then but but, but the thing is is when you start sharing it that way with justification at the center is people listening you know and ideally the world listening 
is hearing the right stuff. That you, then you can talk about anything. And if your yeah. focus is that, they're gonna, it's gonna be like a little funnel. They're gonna be funneled into that central focus. So it doesn't right. matter where they come in from, they're gonna slide in and understand that they're justified. They're gonna understand the central truth. Yeah. And then they're gonna be balanced with everything else Adventism has to teach. Well, the, the one great balancing, stabilizing truth has been the most neglected truth. Because even those that have been sometimes the advocates of justification, yeah. teach it in such a glib kind of uh, – they, they do make it like God's goofing off with paperwork up in heaven. And they do emphasize it and teach it in such a way that creates this kind of licentious atmosphere. That, of course, is not truly preaching justification by faith. If you want to preach justification by faith, why don't you start with Romans chapter 1, then you read Romans 2, and then you're on your way to 3, then 4. Now, you have to go through 1 through 3 to get to 4. 1 yeah. through 3 is you are trapped, you are condemnable, you are a child of wrath, you're under the death sentence, and you have five minutes. You're now eating your last plate of macaroni and cheese, and uh, you wanted a Capri Sun and some strawberry ice cream. And you're trying to gut it down as you're about to be wheeled in uh, to receive the death penalty. That's the climate that Paul speaks about justification by faith. He doesn't speak from a place you're on a hammock, you're, you know, in and Getty and you're drinking, you know, a, a drink with an umbrella in it. And we're sitting there postulating about justification. That's not at all the climate that Paul uses justification by faith. By the time... So that, that's why the lack of the emphasis of the law has created false ideas of what it really means to be justified. Because only a person that is under the law cries out for right. justification. And that is what is lacking so heavily. This is a time for the law, the righteousness of God, immutable, unmovable law that is like a bronze sea over our head. And the only way that that's going to part is that there is a righteousness beyond us, a righteousness obtained to where God can part the clouds of the bronze sky and shine his light upon us and say, you are pardoned, my friend. You are free. You are set free. Go and sin no more. There's not a single person that has gone through that experience that speaks so glibly about justification. All right. Sorry. Sorry, but you are bearing false witness. Anybody who speaks glibly about justification by faith is a false witness. They're a son of Belial bearing a false witness against Naboth, you know, because, because Jezebel wants his property. <laughs> I mean, it's like that soft praise condemns justification just as much as perfectionists do. Hmm. And you know what I mean? Because both parties do the same thing. They turn justification by faith into a trinket. Right. And we, I don't know. And if you want to stand in that day too, like you need to be justified. You need to understand that reality. And this is the thing that really gets me going sometimes huh. is when I'm reading statements from her where it says like, you know, especially in Jacob, J Jacob's time of trouble, you read in maybe Patriarchs and Prophets or the Great Controversy, it's always about Jacob's time of trouble. And if you read in Hosea who talks about Jacob, right? He gives you a little insight and says he like fought with God all night. You know, it, it gives you that extra insight here. Let's see if I can like look it up. Can I pull it up? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I love that insight actually. That, that's good Bible student work. Well, I'm glad I can do something. Yeah. Let's see, is it 10? Is it chapter 10? Yeah, I think it's like at the end pretty much. Wait, wait, wait. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Let's see. I don't know. It's a short book, so you read it pretty fast. But we, I marked it in my Bible. I I use the paper Bible. It helps me reference stuff the quickest. Right. That's why primarily. Oh no! I was eleven. Twelve. Here we go. Yeah. Well. So J Jacob's time of trouble. Ready? Yeah. So the Lord also brings a charge to Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to the deeds, he will recompense him. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. Yeah. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. In his strength, 
I always like the, how they put it. In his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept. So this is him prevailing. So Hosea is like, and he prevailed. How? He wept and sought for favor from him. He fought him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. Amen. So I just like when uh, that Hosea says this, or gives us this little insight that he wept. So his prevailing wasn't just that he was determined and fought the angel and like, oh, it's because he was strong enough to hold on to the angel. It's like he sought favor for him, from him, you know? Like that's why he was crying. It was like he knew, he knew he was a... Uh, a little messed up. He knew his sin was big with Esau, you know. He knew that his brother coming with the, the army of, what, 400, like, he deserved. It would be okay for Esau to kill him because of his trickery and deceit, you know. Right. Well, what was the sign of his, um, you know, that he fought and prevailed with God? You know what was the sign? Is the way he were sending those animals off to um, Esau. And that's that. That's what I mean. That wasn't the substance. That was the sign. Yeah. Repentance is a sign. Uh, humility and obedience is a sign. There's no way that you're going to be justified and not have brokenness and humility, and a heart responsive to obedience because you don't want to go back to the city of destruction, and then you, on the other end you don't want to displease the Lord either. And so you're a prisoner of that hope. You're a prisoner of obedience. You be, even call yourself a bond servant at some point. You become really crazy and fanatical that you, that you open up every epistle with, hi, I'm a bond servant. My name's David. <laughs> that was Paul, right? That was, guess, all, that was Peter, too. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, though. In an, if you emphasize sanctification, you're going to end up emphasizing human works. You're going em yeah. to emphasize what you can do. And if you take it a step farther where your justification includes your sanctification, you're going to say how perfect your works. You're not Essentially, you're not going to be weeping at the very end because you're going to be what? You're going to be perfect. Why would you be weeping if you were perfect? Like, oh, because people are hunting you down. It's like, well, you have perfect trust in God. Why do you got to fail? You know, you Amen. and all this other stuff. It's like, no, your perfect faith looks like you repenting. You're, That's a great point. Because what was, what was the harlot in Revelation 18 not doing? Repenting. She didn't yeah, have she the law either, right? So she, she couldn't repent. Have, didn't even she had look no in the sorrow. mirror. Yeah. She had no sorrow. She had no sorrow. There's right. something wrong in the Day of Atonement that you are not afflicted and you have no sorrow when the man of sin, I mean the man of uh, sorrows himself, Christ, you know, grieved for us as he entered into the work of atonement. And God is telling us that there's a problem with the harlot of Proverbs 30 and the harlot of Revelation 18, where there's no sorrow. She sits as, as a queen. She says, I'm not a widow. I don't feel that I have any need to be broken, to be repentant. There is something wrong with that state of mind. On the a Day of Atonement, which the, a big feature of the Day of Atonement is ana, afflict. Yeah. There, why are you not under the soul searching, the affliction that comes from a deep examination of your case? Do you know you want to bring somebody who is non-repentant to a worldly repentance that is rich and increased in goods? You get the IRS to audit them, and they will start sweating. They will be sick. They will wait a minute. Did we? Did, what did we put the gas on? What card? On this card? Or the, oh no! Wait a minute. We're, do, do we have the copier in the office or do we, the IRS, you want to get them to, to yeah. learn repentance? That is it. You, you go through an examination as a Christian when you have the Holy Spirit, when you are looking at the jurisprudence and the court system of God and the sanctuary in heaven and the law of God and advocacy and judge and the whole jurisprudence system that God's trying to give the Christian to have it in their brains that we seem to not have because we're so ontological and community oriented and stuff. But God says, wait, you have a massive legal case going on up here. And yeah. your faith is being determined. Justification is dealing with legal issues, folks. Make no mistake about it. And believe me, that's all you wish that you focused on when Christ shows up in the clouds of glory. You're going to wish you focused on your legal case instead of your experiential experience. Well, how's our experience, though? Did we, did we ever build that coffee house? with the church did we ever do anything about the lights 
oh, we should have took out those hard pews. We're so focused on making ourselves comfortable that we actually think that's our job right now. Yeah. Our job is to enter into a soul searching because we have a case in heaven. Absolutely. There is a there. I'm scared for our generation because we're so orientated towards our experiences and how it makes me feel and how validating it is. You know, economic uh, economists will say, like the only reason stores and malls, retail stores and malls are even selling stuff is because they're selling an experience. Yeah. Literally, everyone my age, including myself, you know, you can't escape growing up in a culture that's like consumer based and experiential based and you get right. so attached to the idea of your experience yeah well like like i'm literally i was at downtown santa cruz yesterday and i noticed everyone is going through this people all around and they all have their ear sets on and they want their soundtrack to their experience walking through santa cruz eh. but they won't yeah. deal with, with the sounds of the street and everything that's around them they don't want what's there. They want to tailor make and to fabricate their exact experience. So they have their little soundtrack ready to go. Click. I'm walking through Santa Cruz. Hey, you know, like they want their soundtrack going on. They want to tailor <laughs> yeah. make their experience for everything. And that's what we do. Everything's individualized now. Right. There is, now, now we, we laugh at that, but I want to take it a little deeper. Okay. Satan isn't just laughing he oh, no. knows the strategy of this yeah. there is something about the unwatchful human mind in which you are constantly gratifying it you're constantly giving it what its impulses are demanding there's something about the microwaveness of yeah instant gratify 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 it's like you become intolerant of everything that god is telling you to do deferment of reward is everything in the christian's life and I don't know, hopefully I can connect this really quick. But, Please. you know, when Jesus says, tells Peter not to sleep, mm -hmm. like, you know, lest you fall into temptation, it's funny, your brain goes into, like, a slower brainwave. And that's why you can get people, if they're in, like, a sleepwalk, and you go tell them to do something, they'll go do it. It doesn't right. matter if it's moral or immoral. They're not thinking that way. They're just going to, oh, this is what I need to do. I'm going to go do it. You know, they're just in that sleep state. And then right. every time you do... Um, every time you create your own experience, right, you're going, you're kind of drifting away from a sober state, you know, to different degrees, but right. nevertheless drifting away from like, oh, and honestly, that to tie to what we're talking to, the Day of Atonement's the point, you're like super sober. You're like going, the, you're trying to fight that current. You're going the other way. You're like, okay, I'm checking every That's the single one day. What was the high priest doing? He couldn't even sleep that night. They were, oh, they were, him, oh yeah, they were feeding him scriptures, taking him through every stage because he had to change his clothes four times. So it's like, remember this, remember this, because they were afraid that he would sin in his dream state. Oh, they wow. were like, stay awake, and they're like coaching him and they're smacking him, whatever they're doing. They're like, all right, now stay focused, stay clear. You're now walking in, you're going to be before the Shekinah glory unveiled. <laughs> like, you oh, can't, yeah have the wrong thought in your head you right. have to be so inculcated in the word of god and so in that other space that if you for once become self-reflective internal and inward processing of your sinful nature you will perish in a nano flash like nadab and abihu don't do it guy don't do it buddy yeah we're wow. counting you our whole nation is counting on you the guy's like what what <laughs> whatever <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's how we're all going into the Day of Atonement. We're going in as the whatever dude. And it's this weird combination when Jesus says, uh, if, when I return, will I find faith? And I come as a thief in the night. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's interesting? That thief in the night, a lot of people will just emphasize the surprise element of it. But what they de-emphasize is the, the horrifying illustration that, that was to a Hebrew. Because if you find a thief in the night, you could only assume that he has bad intentions. Mm. And that's the whole thing. When he comes and you weren't ready for him, you will know that it's not going to be good for you. Or, or, you're, or you're ready. Well, well, he's not a thief in the night to those people. Right. 
It's to the wicked that he's a thief in the night. Yeah. He is the day star. He is the morning star to everyone else. I mean, to, to the righteous. Yeah. But to the wicked, they're eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. They're going on with regular duties. And he shows up. And you could guarantee if the reference is thief in the night in back in Moses' writings, the, uh, you could treat him like a killer at that point because that's a wow. killer. If he's discovered, you're going to be in a fight for your life. That's okay. why I was like, freaked out when, when he thought a robber grabbed him in the middle of the night. And he was in the fight for his life because it, it would be a thief grabbing you in the middle of the night. So how are we... I feel like... You you keep okay. How am I gonna say this? We need to tie this band to this uh, these ideas back to Daniel too. Yeah, we're tying it to the rock. Uh, what was the phrase? Uh, it, what was the Hebrew words we were using that connected uh, this? Righteousness, righteousness, justification, sadek, sadek, okay. and then what was the other term? Oh, mo moya gets. Moya gets. Moyagets. Okay, so we have Moya Getz and we have The Rock. And honestly, our conversation has just been kind of drifting all around the second coming. You know, The Rock, the second coming, and it goes pretty yeah. deep. It's like we yeah. can spiral around through the whole Bible this but, way. But what I don't want to do is to conflate The Rock with the only the second coming. I don't want to conflate those two. Right. I want us to get to the idea that is fluffy and airy fairy as we think October 22, 1844 is, it's not to God. Oh, okay. It's so not we're connecting to, this to God. Right, it's Day of Atonement, too. Day of Atonement is the stone. Jesus coming, well, the whole eschatological process is a part of the Day of Atonement. Jesus coming is a part of the Yoma. Okay. The thousand years in heaven is a part of the Yoma. The destruction of Azazel, the scapegoat that's referenced in Leviticus 16, that's also referenced in Revelation 20, is still a part of the Day of Atonement. Okay. And the Day of Atonement isn't finished until the high priest comes out and tells everyone that all has been made Zadik, restored. <laughs> and what happens there, that is where it's the idea that it's a, are you ready for this? They used to refer to this, are you ready? Yes. As the day where it's a new heaven and new earth to you. After the Day of Atonement? No, that's how they ended the Day of Atonement. Oh, that they was, ended it. That was oh. the rolling credits, baby. Okay. So the new heaven and new earth is rolling credits. Intro is the high priest steps in. Okay. That's the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is all of that process. And that's the stone. The stone is Zadik. Wow. It's justification. It's that's right heavy. by faith. Because, like, if you think about it... Okay, this is my thought right now. So let, let me ask You're, you real quick. With that yeah. in mind, do we emphasize justification by faith with the three angels' message and the stone of Daniel 2? Uh, you no. better. That is the theme. No, right. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying because I'm thinking like, oh, we have we kind of de-emphasize justification by faith. But if it's truly connected to Dave Atonement, which we've just gone over, or it more be the that. most serious thing we talk about. Like, that, yes. you know, like yeah, that. it's so much so that that Habakkuk is using Moya gets Day of yeah. Atonement for justification by faith. Wow. The very phrase we use that, that we like to refer to it as the Reformation, but God says, no, this message of the righteous shall live by faith is what destroys the kingdoms of this world. It's the act of God to, to wrestle the kingdom back to himself, to restore all things. Justification by faith is how he does it. That's why Ellen White says the three angels' message well, it's justification by faith, and verity is what makes up the three angels' message. It is everything is back in property rights to God. We're his property. Those who have died are his property. This earth is his property. All the kings and lords are all under his submission. Isaiah brings that out. I mean, all the kings and lords. He's the lord of the lords and the king of all the kings. I mean, they're all—that that process takes place in the Day of Atonement when everything is brought back 
And it's also called a jubilee. It's the idea where everything that was sold or everything in which you were bond servant, you now get all of your inheritance back and everything else. Because it was also, if it's a high day of atonement, it's also a jubilee, right? So it's the idea of setting the captives free and releasing the land and entering into the land of milk and honey. And you enter into your rest and it's a new heaven and new earth. It's a day of atonement. It's a jubilee. It's everything put together. Wow. And this is what we're not antitypically participating now in the day of atonement guess what we're in the real deal now zach and it's our generation and we're the most asleep at the wheel generation ever because satan out of all the messages that this cosmic universe needs to have proclaimed right now it's human beings uplifting the high priestly work of jesus christ imputing its righteousness and for some reason we are highly orientated towards us and our feelings and our experiences and validating that. And God says, wow, out of all the times of human history, this is where are the people that will so uplift the court in heaven, the court case in heaven, the judge and the advocate of heaven, the law of heaven, who's gonna keep on looking till the stone is cut out? Who's gonna keep on looking till the judgment was set and the books were open? Who's gonna keep on looking till October 22, 1844, who's going to keep on looking past all of this, the beasts, the animals coming up out of the sea, look past all this, who's that people going to transcend all of that and paint the picture of the cosmic conflict and the reality that we need to have righteousness totally. So God is going to destroy everything outside of that covenant righteousness. He's going to deconstruct it and turn this earth into toho boho, into without form and void. He's gonna start all over again. He's gonna just hit reset. He's gonna erase the board, totally, <laughs> total erasing. Unless and, you're in that covenant. In him, in Christ, in written on the palms of his hands. Our tears are in a bottle. We have, you know what I did on my, my walk today? What'd you do? This is what I did. I, I went for a walk in the Redwoods today, and my prayer was this, God, if there is only you know how to give me genuine repentance, only you know what Satan is going to bring to my court case. Only you really know whether I'm fooling myself and I've satisfied myself on false, uh, on repentance to be repented of. Only you really know the actual um, situation in which my danger is. I'm giving you permission to get way past all of that and to bring me to a place that I will not be naked and ashamed on that day, that I will not stand in massive regret because I did not come and bring all that you wanted to search out in my heart. I didn't want to come and deal with the shame of that experience. So I didn't give you access to that. And then I found myself to be weighed in the balances and found wanting on that day. I give you permission to take me through whatever that takes so I could have your blood splashed across all of those sins that Satan is going to bring up that he already has a fateful recording of. Please, God, do that way beyond what I'm going to probably let you do in my natural man. I give you that permission. And do you know how scared I was when I said that? You know how terrified that made me feel? Because I am asking him to do whatever it takes. And if it means the pulling out of a right eye or my right hand or allow me to go through experiences and he says, David... From that perspective, this is what it took to get you down to there. So, so am I open to glib descriptions of imputation of righteousness? Not at all. No. It will be to our death if we have such presumptuous views of what it really means to confess, to repent, to be broken, to be justified. Amen. Well, thanks, oh, David. David. Yeah. On the I day of atonement. I think I'm going to end the video here so and then post it. All right, man. Well, hey, listen, let's also, you know, I we mean, you can do another here. one. No, 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 we don't have to do another one. But, I mean, let's keep in prayer that people really get it. I mean, there is no denomination in the world. That's what I said about Adventism. Why is it that there's only one yeah. group of people that have this one truth, and it happens to be the only truth that will break through all of these other lies. And it just so happens, ironically, to be a message of justification by faith 
in such a way that it should bring every single man's glory to the dust of the ground. 